Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Robert. I'm Robert Cheney, director of the Clocks, Watches, and Scientific Instruments Department at Skinner. And for those of you who have not been here before, uh, welcome. Those of you who uh, uh, have been here before, we thank you for coming back and uh, hope you come back again and continue to spend money. <laughs> uh, our next sale is uh, April 29th uh, for this uh, category. We have two sales a year. And uh, we just are a small piece of the Skinner pie, as you can tell from the various catalogs that are offered. Uh, there are over 20 um, there are over 20 categories um, offered here at Skinner, and um, we profess to have uh, experts in each in each field. Um, my uh, right hand man is Jay Dowling in the back uh, with the white shirt, and without him, uh, I would not be possible practically. <laughs> so thank you, Jay, for for your help. Uh, we also welcome those who are um, watching this live on the um, uh, uh, Skinner YouTube channel. Uh, we're trying something new and streaming this live so that we can uh, show our West Coast um, clients and friends um, this lecture uh, because we certainly uh, consider it uh, an important uh, presentation. So out of courtesy, I hope we all can silence our uh, cell phones and um, not have that uh, interrupt the, uh, the speaker. And <clears throat> our speaker tonight is speaking on a very important day or a very important evening. And I won't um, throw the cat out of the bag. I'll let him tell you what's so special about today. And um, he has the world's greatest job in horology. I mean, let's face it. This guy takes care of the most important clocks in the world, and these clocks never need anything done to them. They just <laughs> run and run and run and run. They run almost nonstop for 35 years. They require no lubrication, and basically, other than minor little tweaks here and there, the only reason they take these clocks apart is to study them and to write about them and so on. So, wow, what a job. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Rory here. Uh, he is fresh uh, back to dismantle the um, uh, exhibition down at Mystic River Seaport. And um, the exhibition of, uh, uh, of ships, clocks, and stars is heading off to Sydney, Australia now. It's been in Washington, D.C. It's been in Mystic, Connecticut. And shortly, it will get packed up and move to uh, Sydney, Australia. And Rory plays an important role in being sure that these uh, precious timekeepers uh, get safely uh, transported. Um, from the Royal Observatory, we have Rory McAvoy. And Rory, we would like to welcome you to Skinner. And uh, we are really looking forward to your presentation. Rory McAvoy. Uh, thank you, Robert, for that very kind introduction, and, and thank you all for, for coming along this evening. As Robert said, um, I'm here um, partly to take down the exhibition at Mystic Seaport, um, but you still have about a week 
to enjoy it. And I really do, if you haven't seen it, it is well worth a visit. We have some of the most important historical timekeepers in the history of navigation on display um, in Mystic. So, so do get along if you can. Anyway, uh, commercial business aside, um, let's move on. So tonight's talk um, could not be, um, we, we, it, it couldn't be a more appropriate date um, to deliver this talk, a celebration of the work of John Harrison. I'm going to be introducing you to some of the probable influences on his work. Um, and then look beyond his life and look at the influence and the effect on the modern world. Um, and one project in particular, which I believe would have been very close to John Harrison's heart. So, starting at the beginning, um, let's look at one of the biggest milestones in the history of horological technology. Um, and that would be Galileo and his harnessing the properties of the pendulum as a timekeeping device. The famous story that he observed a lamp swinging in the cathedral, um, I won't dwell on that, but what I was particularly interested, I read um, uh, some of the work of Stillman Drake, and Stillman Drake um, said that the pendulum work of Galileo marks the commencement of the modern era of physics. And the early experiments that um, Galileo was interested in, um, that demanded uh, accurate short interval timing, um, were quite interesting. And it was his investigations into natural acceleration and trying to determine the speed of, um, uh, of acceleration due to gravity. Um, now, I think for the sake of, I've got a lot to pack in, so I shall move on quite quickly in this early period on to Christian Huygens in the mid-1650s, 1658. He publishes this important pamphlet, and it announces that he has successfully applied the pendulum to the mechanical clock. An incredible achievement, and a very important one. And when you read this pamphlet, what is very interesting is that um, Huygens was looking at this not so much as an improvement to land-based science, but he was looking at this as a potential longitude solution. He was very excited about that. Um, and shortly after that pamphlet was published, this, this painting by Backhausen um, featuring a Dutch ship in a perilous um, proximity to, uh, to, to rocks and what have you, just to illustrate the fact that in the 1600s, nations are branching out, they're pushing boundaries, they're exploring and wanting to get further and get <coughs> safely to acquire goods to bring back home, um, being a critical motivation there. And this pamphlet, I think, is a wonderful way of introducing the problems of the time. So the first section of the longitude will ignore the astrological yeah. wax. <laughs> Tobacco, a product brought from overseas, of Europe being too full of people. Now there's a reason to get votes out there. So of the longitude, now this pamphlet is thought to be satirical, though reading it with modern eyes, it is difficult to get into the sense of humor. But what this draws upon is a scientific proposal of the early 1600s of a German physician called Goclenius. Goclenius suggested um, a magical healing powder, which he called the powder of sympathy. Goclenius describes how to prepare the powder. You get Roman vitriol, that is copper sulfate, and you grind it up and you dry it when the sun is in Aries. <laughs> then the powder is charged with this property, this healing property. And if you have a wound inflicted by a blade, if you have the blade and you dip the blade in the powder, this will transfer the healing powder, the properties of the powder of sympathy to the wound remotely. It's quite extraordinary. If you don't follow the instructions, it really doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, 
This pamphlet takes up on this idea, which has been brought up again by a very serious man, Sir Kenelm Digby, very intelligent, very well educated, well traveled, and he is talking about the powers of sympathy seriously. And this pamphlet is possibly lampooning Kenelm Digby. And it suggests the longitude solution lies with the powder of sympathy. And it involves an unfortunate dog, a blade, and a bowl of powder of sympathy. The blade, you can imagine what happens to the dog. He gets put on board the ship with a bandage. The powder of sympathy and the blade remain at home. And somebody is in charge of placing the blade into the powder of sympathy at precisely noon. The idea being that the powder will transfer its properties to the dog and the dog will react at noon home time. And that way you have the world's first remote time signal and your method of solving the longitude. Not possibly a serious proposal. But it does very neatly um, wrap up what the problem of the longitude was. It was knowing how far east or west you are at a given point, and the obvious way to find that is by knowing what the difference is in time between your home port and your current location. So you can find out time on board a ship, local time that is, by observing the sun. So what you need is a means to carry the time. And this is what Christian Haugens was so excited about. The new pendulum clock he thought could be put on board a ship and keep time sufficiently well to make comparisons with the sun and therefore calculate your east-west position whilst at sea. But it didn't quite work out like that. Now this is a really exciting addition to uh, the National Maritime Museum's collection of early timekeepers. This is one of Christian Haugen's experimental clocks that were made shortly after um, the publication of Horologium. Um, and of the type that was sent on a voyage in the seven, early 1770s. Um, the astronomer charged with these sea clocks was um, Monsieur Richet. Um, the ship on which these clocks were on board at Mr. Richet sailed into a storm shortly, not far off the coast of France. So right at the beginning of the voyage, very violent storm, the ship was tossed about, the clocks crashed about, one was dashed to pieces, the others, they were. Richet decided that they just weren't good enough and he abandoned the trial. Much to Christian Haugen's displeasure when he returned to France. Now Christian Haugen's set upon improving this pendulum design. And here we have a triangular pendulum to try and limit the sideways motion of the ship affecting the pendulum. But the next ship going out on a scientific expedition, at the time that this prototype was being created, um, the astronomer appointed to that ship was also Monsieur Richet. And so Christian Haugen's decided not to send this type of timekeeper. So, but I think Christian Haugen's realized the shortcomings of the pendulum and how it would not work at sea. So he changed his um, ideas a little and looked at the circular balance wheel. And this is described as his perfect marine balance. Now why I'm showing you this is I want to show you that there are connections between makers and including Harrison with the development of this technology. And what I'd like you to look at is at the center at about five o'clock, there is a sort of uh, a trumpet shaped piece with a string. Now the string is attached to a weight that is not illustrated on here. And as the balance turns, it pulls the weight up in the air. And then of course gravity then pulls down and the cord um, working on those cheeks gives you what is desired, um, an even vibration at all amplitudes. So if it's a big turn of the balance, that curve on that trumpet case will speed up the return of the balance so that even the shorter arcs and the longer arcs, they take the same period of time. So that's the theory there. Now this is um, produced towards the end of Christian Haugen's life in 1695. 
Um, now we'll pick up the story a little later in the 1720s. And this is um, an English watchmaker based in Versailles, working for Louis XIV. And if you look in the center of this design, you can see a very similar trumpet piece with a cord hanging down. And behind that, it is attached to a balance. So here we have a very clear picking up of Haugen's ideas and trying to transfer them into this. And this one is peculiar. The balance wheel is connected not to a weight hanging freely, but a pendulum, but on the horizontal plane. So it's the pendulum on the horizontal plane that is acting to restore the balance. Here is the actual timekeeper. Now, in the book published um, by Sully, um, he describes at great length um, the work that he went to perfect the curves in order to gain this um, important property, the isochronism of the balance. And he described um, that he couldn't make the curves work mathematically, so he made them by experiment. And he tried to use steel chains, the type that you would find in a fusy watch. But he found that they very quickly rusted and became solidified, and so they didn't offer the smooth motion. He tried hair, and as you can see here, the design now has been relegated to a pivoted brass rod. Now, Sully's ideas did not <coughs> succeed, but it is very interesting that he published um, and he published correspondence with uh, George Graham, which is particularly revealing um, and connects to John Harrison. And here we have, slightly anachronistically, the portrait, the King portrait of uh, John Harrison, which was painted in 1767. I don't have a portrait of the young Harrison, so if we bear that in mind, we look at some of John Harrison's early work. Now, this is a really interesting, this came on the market relatively recently, um, and it is a surveyor's compass. Um, and I don't think you'll be able to make out from the screens here, but it is signed John Harrison and dated 1718. So when John Harrison was around 25 years old, we know that he was involved in surveying. So this is the type with a plain table. So John Harrison, who is an unlikely candidate, perhaps, for a clockmaker, uh, somebody who would make seagoing clocks, because, of course, his background is carpentry. But I want to show you tonight that his background, albeit carpentry, is, is much more than simply cabinet making. <clears throat> so here's an example that he is able to use no doubt self-taught. There were plenty of books around, like um, uh, William Laban's um, treatise on surveying. So John Harrison was quite a, a versatile character, and he was making clocks. Here we have two examples of his work. The first, the largest one, the movement that you see there, is in this collection of the Science Museum. And this is more of a copy of 30-hour clocks that were in existence, made in brass and steel, but here, Harrison using wood with a brass style. And the other clock on the right is, um, uh, gosh, memory loss, jet lag kicking in, sorry. Um, this is from the Abbey, which the name will come to me. I think I need a glass of water and a refresh, so I'm going to leave you with some church bells for 30 seconds. Okay, so that's 30 seconds inside the belfry of Worcester Cathedral. There was, I, I, I give you that image uh, and footage for very good reason. And now what you saw there was um, a, a, a complex arrangement of bells in a wooden frame. And those bells, tremendous uh, weight to them. And they're being swung through a significant arc 
and maintained by a human being pulling on the rope. Now, one of the things that John Harrison tells us in a manuscript of 16, uh, 1763 is that some of his intuition into the study of maintaining a pendulum or a balance wheel came from his experience as a bell ringer. But more than that, his brother, who James, who was involved in making a series of early long case clocks, we know made a living um, fitting bell frames. So this working with wood goes beyond simple furniture work or what have you. It is really serious civil engineering and you, you really need to know your stuff to make a frame that can carry that sort of weight and oscillations of that that type. So so two, I think, quite quite interesting insights into John Harrison's influence in influences into his work. So when we talk about the precision timekeeping, it really starts with this at Brocklesby Park. Um, this um, commission for the Earl of Yarborough is an extraordinary thing. This is a clock that now runs without lubrication. What is interesting is that it appears that it didn't start out that way. Um, this is um, taken from William Laycock's book. This is uh, an example of uh, John Harrison's gearing where he's using round pinion rollers with quite straight sided teeth. So it's a sort of a tangential gearing rather than the traditional cycloidal gearing that you see in clockwork. So his ideas are already quite far apart um, from traditional clock making. So this is the uh, type of escapement that was probably fitted to the clock at Brocklesby Park. You can see it's a very carefully engineered uh, pallet shape so that you get um, as smooth as possible a contact, but nonetheless it is a sliding contact. So this is a, an escapement that requires lubrication. And because it requires lubrication, requires frequent attention. Now, it seems as though Harrison wanted to avoid returning to the site to attend to the clock. And when we look at this detail of the escapement, courtesy of Andrew King, if you look at the brass frame, you see grasshopper pallets for which John Harrison is famous for inventing. But if you look at the frame, you can see where the original steel pallets were fitted so we have evidence here of a change in thinking, an improvement, sort of necessity being the mother of invention. And then the next stage in John Harrison's progression in clockmaking is, is these two long case clocks. Now these are quite extraordinary. They, like Brocklesby, run without lubrication. This has a tremendous advantage uh, because of course oils are not stable. They change, they get stickier, they get, in, in, when they get cold, they get a bit stickier. When they get warmer, more fluid. When they get more fluid, they tend to run away from the components that they're supposed to lubricate. And of course, in the long term, they start to break down, generate acids, cause corrosion, all manner of problems. But if you don't have the oil, then of course, you have an immediate advantage of stability in transmission of power from the weights, the springs, through to the, um, the important part that ticks the escapement. So these two clocks have John Harrison's grasshopper escapement and their pendulum clocks. But they also feature a very clever form of temperature compensation. John Harrison successfully used brass and steel together in such a way that they worked in, in opposition and by selecting the right lengths of each material, according to the uh, coefficients of their expansion in heat, he was able to create a pendulum that, despite the materials expanding and contracting, always stayed at the same length. This is an, a very elegant solution to the problem of temperature change in metals. Now, John Harrison claimed that these timekeepers could keep time to a second a month. And one wonders, you know, how on earth did he know that they were that good? 
he didn't have a speaking clock to bring up or a radio. And so he describes that he observed bright stars transiting, passing against his window frame and the chimney um, of, of a neighboring house. And this again is an example of John Harrison using books that are circulating around at that time. And this is Smith's Horological Disquisitions, which gives a very good description of how to rate your clock by observing stars. And in this, you can see uh, a black um, sort of splodge on the right hand side, and that is um, a simple brass sighting device that you can bang into a door frame to align your eye against, and as Smith said, against the edge of any chimney or the side of any house. And you will see the star vanish in a moment, and you can mark at what time your clock was reading. So here is where Harrison is using material that is available, self-education, to fulfill um, his work. Now, this form of temperature compensation, I did say, was very elegant. And I think that this invention is absolutely critical to the whole Harrison story. I don't think that it would have happened had it not been for this invention. I say that because, well, we think that John Harrison went to London with an idea that this incredibly accurate te clock technology could be made portable and could be a viable solution for the longitude. And of course, as you no doubt know, there was a, a reward on offer of up to £20,000 for anybody who could find a practicable solution to the longitude. Now, he first went to see Edmund Halley, the, the astronomer royal at Greenwich, who was not a mechanic and told him to go to see George Graham. Now, George Graham was a watch and clockmaker. Not only that, though, he was a man of science. He made scientific instruments. He made some of the very important telescopes at Greenwich, as well as the clocks. In 1726, George Graham published a paper in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society describing his invention of a temperature compensating pendulum. Now, George Graham designed a system where you had a steel rod, which will get longer and shorter in heat. But if you have a glass jar full of mercury as the weight of the pendulum, the level of the mercury will rise when it gets warmer, thus raising the center of gravity of the bob. And if you get the level of mercury just right, you'll have an equilibrium. So your temperature, your, your, sorry, your pendulum clock will be resilient to temperature change. But in that paper, he describes trying to use combinations of other metals with different coefficients of expansion. And along comes Harrison and to uh, un unable to do so. And along comes John Harrison with this incredible gridiron pendulum with nine bars, four of, uh, I think it's four of steel, five of steel, four of brass. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, showing uh, I've seen enough of them. Uh, but um, so, yes, because you, you have more steel than you have brass. Um, because the steel expands at a lesser rate than the brass. Um, and so having that odd, you get the right um, equilibrium that you require. So John, uh, George Graham must have been tremendously impressed. Um, and as Harrison described, after, uh, after being somewhat rough with Harrison, they eventually got the ice broke. And I suspect that it's the green iron pendulum that did just that. So with George Graham's support, um, lending money from his own pocket and encouraging his friends from the Royal Society um, and also from the East India Company to also contribute towards Harrison to help put his ideas into practice. So John Harrison is able to go back home, no doubt, with materials and having been able to research the libraries and information that's in London and sets to work on his first marine timekeeper which we call today H1. So this remarkable machine, I mean, it looks like nothing else that came before. Um, when John Harrison presented this in London in 1736, it must have caused a tremendous stir. 
I mean, visually it's amazing, but what it does is even more amazing. So we've established that the pendulum is useless at sea. The motion of a ship just negates its practicability. So what John Harrison did was he used two dumbbell-like balances, and he had them swinging in opposition. Um, and they're restored, not by gravity, but by the springs. You can see two of them at the top. And so because they're working in opposition, if you imagine that there's a force traveling through the side of the timekeeper, you will have equal and opposite. The, the forces will cancel themselves out. That is the <coughs> idea. And so a trial was arranged for H1. And H1 was put on board HMS Centurion, um, sent off to Lisbon with John Harrison um, with the timekeeper. Um, just out of interest, I'm showing uh, Centurion here on the screen. That is the ship on your left. Um, it's seen here off the coast of Chile, inconveniencing the Spanish. <laughs> in the mid-1700s with Admiral Anson on board. But before this, it, it is carrying um, John Harrison and H1 to Lisbon. Now, the journey to Lisbon was terribly rough. Um, John Harrison reports being terribly seasick and the timekeeper not working very well at all. It appears that in testing the timekeeper on the mouth of the River Humber, John Harrison really had not grasped how rough it could get out at sea. But the return journey was significantly calmer, and the timekeeper formed, performed well. So much so that John Harrison was able to identify the first sighting of land um, and differentiate it being from the lizard from Stark Point, which was a difference of 60 nautical miles, but not a, more importantly, it meant they knew where they were in relation to the Eggestone Rocks, which of course is valuable knowledge. So, with this success, John Harrison is issued a certificate um, by navigators from the flotilla of ships and comes back to London. And the Board of Longitude is formed for the very first time to discuss this success. Now, John Harrison could perhaps have pushed for reward money, but chose not to. Instead, he was quite straightforward about it and said, my timekeeper needs improvement. And the Board of Longitude agreed to advance him money to start work on a second machine. And here we have the second machine, which we call H2. We're very imaginative. <laughs> H2 took a very short, relatively short time to make, um, under three years. H2 was never trialed at sea because in testing it at home, John Harrison realized that there was a flaw in the twin balance system. And he realized that if the timekeeper was in a sort of sideways motion, then centrifugal force could come into effect and actually hold the balances <coughs> apart or together, depending on which end you're looking at. Um, and of course, then affect the timekeeping of the machine. So again, back to the board of longitude. And again, they agree to forward more money, start working on this machine, which I think you can guess the name of. <laughs> this machine is, there is an obvious difference. We are now looking at circular balances rather than bar balances. Um, and of course the circular balance is far more resistant to central fugal force. Just in case you have not seen the real things, these are large timekeepers. These, I mean, from the table here, you're looking at about that height. They're seriously big, heavy, slow machines. And, well, it is quite clear that during the making of this, John Harrison started to have serious doubts about the principles that he started with. These wonderful machines that compensate for temperature, they compensate to a point for motion. But they had problems. He, he just, this one, he was working on for 19 years, which is quite a significant difference in the last. But in those 19 years, it all was not lost. I mean, there were some very practical 
outputs from this machine. This piece here, which perhaps looks like a, a, a caliper you might see on a watchmaker or a clockmaker's bench, is actually um, a bimetallic strip used in the temperature compensation. Now, when my former colleague Jonathan Betts took this machine apart a few years ago, we were lent some very, very sophisticated optical scanning equipment. And we were able to scan this piece. And you see the bright yellow spots. These are the rivets that hold the two sheets, the brass and the steel, together. And this machine showed us that the rivets, the placing of the rivets, was accurate to within a few microns. And this is made in the mid-1700s. This is incredible stuff. But it does appear that the bimetallic strip was a later addition to the original design when Harrison started reworking his ideas. <coughs> this is another important part. This is a part of the original design, but is a tr has a tremendous um, part in modern day society. This is what John Harrison refers to as a caged roller bearing. Um, now, everybody who has a car owns many forms of these. Anything with an axle that whizzes round and has a ball bearing race in it owes it to this technology. So it starts in age three. So, and when you look at this image, I mean, it is beautiful craftsmanship. And this is made of a very high tin bronze, so it has, um, it's very hard wearing for the type of work that it does. John Harrison in this machine used bronze very carefully and he changed the mix of the alloy in order, uh, according to the purpose of the part that he was making. So the arbors are much softer because, but pieces like this, which are rolling, he wanted to have a very hard but they were unlikely to um, suffer stresses to cause them to, to, to shatter. So two very important inventions that come out of H3. Now this is uh, a drawing of the original, we think, the original incarnation of H3. And what you see is the large circle in this picture, you can see just over a quarter of it. That is one of the balance wheels. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the cage roller bearing. But what I find really interesting, and this is something we discovered with Jonathan's research into H3, was that there is a connection with the past in this machine. And if we go back to Sully's timekeeper, here we have a linkage between a circular balance, and on Sully's machine, we've got a pivoted pendulum. But on John Harrison's machine, it appears that we have a bimetallic strip acting as a sprung pendulum rather than a gravity-assisted pendulum. So this is really interesting, and this, I feel, shows the influence of George Graham on John Harrison's work. And of course, George Graham dies in 1751, midway through this process with H3. And I think that George, the death of George Graham, George Graham had been a, a good friend and mentor to Harrison. And I think that this really was a, a crisis point for Harrison, but not perhaps a negative. So here we are back at King's portrait of John Harrison from 1677, and in John Harrison's hand, he has a pocket watch. And this is what we refer to as the Jeffreys pocket watch. Harrison commissioned John uh, Jeffries to make a watch to a different specification to the norm. And by making very simple improvements to the existing design of watch, he greatly improved its stability as a timekeeper. Simply speeding up the ticking of the watch and changing the distribution of the weight in the balance, he was able to give the watch much more resilience to motion and of course, this develops into the timekeeper known as H4, <laughs> which, of course, was sent on two trials. Um, the first being to Jamaica. The trial was a success, and 
the watch performed within the requirements of the Act of 1714. But when the watch was returned, the Board of Longitude were expecting to see the watch reading, if we like, Greenwich Mean Time. But of course it didn't. The watch had a rate. The watch can be a useful marine navigation device. It doesn't have to keep perfect time. It can go fast. It can go slow. But as long as it gains or loses the same amount every day, then it is a buy. It could gain an hour a day, and it would still be a practical, useful navigational watch. So that trial is not satisfactory. The business of rate now understood. The watch is sent out on trial again, this time to Barbados. Now here, if you've read David Sobel's book, Longitude, you will know that Neville Maskelyne comes into the story and he is portrayed as somewhat of a villain. Um, and it is interesting, reading through letters from Neville Maskelyne, he's sent out ahead and he's sent out to test the astronomical method, which has come to fruition at the same time as the timekeeper the lunar distance method. So Maskelyne is sent ahead to test the lunar distance method, is successful, and then is tasked with placing the longitude of Barbados and verifying the going of the watch when it arrives. Neville Maskelyne writes a letter home to his brother, and it's an extraordinary letter for Neville Maskelyne because it's, it's very warm and it's, it's, uh, he's clearly very happy. Um, and you can imagine William Harrison, John Harrison's son, turning up after a long voyage, finding this very happy astronomer royal, um, having successfully uh, navigated by what could be perceived as a rival method. But of course, it doesn't turn out to be. But anyway, the trial was a success. The watch did indeed behave in accordance well within the specification of, of the criteria for reward money. Um, and that's a potential £20,000, which is a seriously life-changing sum of money. But, as, as you all know if you've read this book, that there is a considerable prevarication and there's um, a series of demands uh, are put upon Harrison. Um, the Board of Longitude want to be satisfied that the watch can be replicated. And so, Oh, here, actually, I should show you the, the, the movement for H4. It, it is an extraordinarily beautiful um, object. Now, you can see the original, um, not the movement, the movement is in Greenwich, but the case, the dial, and the hands are at Mystic Seaport. And also, Larkham Kendall's um, first copy, a very faithful copy of H4, is also at Mystic Seaport. These are tremendously important. Um, so it's a real uh, must-see uh, event. So here we have a very large balance wheel. Um, in here, we've got the watch speeded up dramatically in comparison to your average uh, pocket watch. We have a watch that is beating 18,000 times a minute. That's five times per second. And of course, that is the DNA, if you like, of the modern mechanical watch. The majority of Swiss wristwatches, like this one from the 1940s, have 18,000 trains. The distribution of mass on the balance enables the watch to recover quite quickly from movement, um, so lending itself very well to being worn on the wrist. So we have a lot to thank um, this whole process of invention on John Harrison's behalf. Now this is a detail from Larkin Kendall's copy, just to give you an idea of the exquisite workmanship. Uh, not only is it um, a very reliable timekeeper, but it is, when you open it up, beautifully made. Now this timekeeper, Larkin Kendall's first timekeeper, known as K1, was sent with Captain Cook on his second voyage of discovery. And Captain Cook, using both the lunar distance method and the marine timekeeper was able to navigate far better than anybody else had been able to do so before. And he referred to the timekeeper as his trusted friend. And it's this voyage that really cements the whole thing, that the timekeeper, 
the success of H4 was not a fluke. But that doesn't stop the um, procrastination, if you like, um, in producing the reward that John Harrison felt that at this stage he was rightly owed. This I thought I would put in. It's a rather wonderful insight into the importance of Cook's voyage. This is bring, bringing back news of far-flung places and new discoveries. And this is the first sighting of a kangaroo seen in London. So the kangaroo was um, stuffed, brought back, and Stubbs, the painter more famously uh, connected with horses, was asked to paint this. And there's a dingo, and these recently have come into the Maritime Museum's art collection, which is a tremendous uh, new addition um, and, and a very important point in the history of, of, of the world and exploration. So back to John Harrison. Now, the year before John Harrison dies, it, he publishes this book. Now, the title alone is difficult. It gives you some indication of what the contents are going to be like. I mean, a description concerning such mechanism as will afford a nice or true mensuration of time, together with some account of the attempts for the discovery of the longitude by the moon, as also an account of the discovery of the scale of music. There's a lot mixed in there. <laughs> we have the manuscript for this book, and it is the same as the text in the printed version. This was not edited. This was written in a single session, it seems, and put straight into print. And it would have benefited from a very aggressive editor. We have, uh, we have footnotes that span two pages. There is a distinct economy of full stops. It is a very difficult read. Um, but when one does dip into it, you get a real sense of Harrison's frustration and bitterness. By this time, he has been rewarded and he has been given, in total, more than the original sum, but he is not a happy man. And the book, in essence, is describing his pendulum clock technology, which is where he starts out with. And I think that this was very dear to his heart. And I think Today, being able to talk about this on his birthday, I think, is absolutely appropriate because in recent times at Greenwich <coughs> Observatory, we have had the most extraordinary experience. Now, Bill Laycock wrote a book, The Lost Science of John Harrison. He died very shortly after publication, but Martin Burgess, uh, a sculptural clockmaker, was highly influenced by this work. Um, and he and a group of other people set about trying to make sense of John Harrison's pendulum clock theory. And they did this by studying all of the manuscripts and the text contained within this, as I say, rather difficult to read book. So this is an example of Martin Burgess's sculptural horology. Um, rather naughtily named uh, Simon's Balls. <laughs> this Simon was uh, an empresario, a music uh, manager. He managed pop bands in, in London. And he commissioned Martin to make uh, a, a stunning hypnotic clock. And this clock was in his offices. And it seems to have served the purpose of suitably hypnotizing his potential clients so that they were more concerned with the clock than they were with the contracts that they were signing. <laughs> I kid you not. But it is very Harrisonian. This is, if you like, half of the technology in H1. And if you can see on these videos, we have the bar balances oscillating back and forth, maintained by a skate wheel with the grasshopper escapement. And it's a very beautiful eye-catching clock. Now, this clock started a clock collector, some of you will know, uh, Don Saff, on a journey. He discovered a plate on the clock that indicated that Burgess had made the clock. He then set about tracking Martin Burgess down, which ultimately he did succeed in. 
But in doing so, he went, there was a symposium held in, in Harvard in 1993 um, to celebrate um, the, the birthday of uh, John Harrison. Martin Burgess presented a paper called The Scandalous Neglect of John Harrison's Pendulum Clock Theory. Um, and in this, he talks about a clock that he was commissioned to make, which is known as the Gurney Clock. The Gurney family were a Norwich family of bankers, and they wanted to give something back to the people of Norwich. And so they thought, what better, let's commission an exciting public clock for the people of Norwich. So Martin set about working. The commission came in 17, uh, sorry, 1975, which was the 200th anniversary of the publication of Concerning Such Mechanism, the book that I showed you earlier. And so he thought, what better clock to produce than one based on this theory that we think, you know, that people were, were trying to, to uh, understand. So Martin tells us that the, the clock um, was a little bit um, overdue when the customer finally received it. He'd been working and adjusting the clock for over almost 12 years <laughs> before they got it. And so Martin was never able to fully get to the bottom of the theory that people believed was correct um, using this clock. But in true Harrisonian fashion, Martin used two clocks. He made two clocks at the same time, made them identical. Um, and the purpose of having two identical clocks in the workshop was that if you made an adjustment, you would only adjust one clock and you'd use the other one to gauge the effect of the adjustment. Very simple, but sensible practice. So here are the two clocks. On the left hand side, we have the Gurney clock, and this is in its last home in a shopping centre in Norwich, and behind it, an elaborate series of automaton. And on the right, this is the clock known as Clock B, which is now hanging in my workshop at the Royal Observatory, which is a great privilege, and it has been a tremendously exciting um, few years. We've had the clock for uh, about four years now. Here is the clock. It, looks almost like a scene from ER. We have uh, Dr. Betts in the background with his white coat. We have uh, William Andrews, uh, Philip White, Martin Dorsch, and Roger Stevenson of Brodshams, and, and of course Kathy um, with, with Jonathan in the background. So um, Dolce bought Clock B in the condition that you saw in the last slide, and commissioned Charles Frodsham and Co. to finish it to a point where it could be used to experiment and test out this extraordinary theory. Now, John Harrison made a claim, not in concerning such mechanism, in 1730, in the 1730 manuscript, he made a claim that he could make a clock that would keep time to within a few seconds a year, which is, for the 1730s, an extraordinary claim. And by the time he produces Concerning Such Mechanism, I and mean, the book was panned by critics, um, and every, people were very upset by a lot of the uh, vitriolic stuff that he said about board of longitude and other people, um, and so it was dismissed. Nobody took it seriously. A few makers tried the grasshopper escapement, Benjamin Balumi, for, for example, made a few clocks that sort of adhere somewhat to Harrison's methods. But this is the first serious attempt at reproducing what was believed to be Harrison's theory. So here is the clock in action. Um, now, not only is this an extraordinarily accurate clock, but it is a thing of beauty, which is quite rare. When you look at precision clocks today, there's usually gaffer tape somewhere and uh, if there's electronics involved, there'll be a bank of old computers or wires everywhere. This is very elegant, um, very beautiful, and as I say, incredibly accurate. When, when the clock came to us at the Royal Observatory, it was 
keeping superb time. It was not affected by temperature, but it was affected by barometer change. So when the air got more dense, the clock ran a little slower. And we had a, a computer using an optical sensor tracking the behavior of the clock, and we had a weather station inside the case with the clock tracking the environmental conditions. And when you look at these graphs, you can see the clock's rate going up and down, and you can see the barometer going down and up. It's extraordinary. So we had a really good mechanical barometer. <laughs> <laughs> now, according to John Harrison's theory, now using cheeks to limit the working length of the suspension spring at the top of the pendulum. John Harrison said, if you get the thickness of the spring just right, then you'll be able to counteract. Using the cheeks, you'll be able to correct for this change due to the air thickening or thinning. Now, I have to say, I was very skeptical about this, and many of my colleagues were as well. But Jonathan and I did a series of tests called the Hill Tests, where we uh, set the clock running at different amplitudes and checked how many seconds per day the rate was. And when we got it in the, just the right place, by changing the thickness of the suspension spring, we were incredibly lucky. We got the thickness. The, the thickness was just right. And the analysis that followed showed that we had corrected the barometric problem to within about 5% of the extent of it, which was extraordinary. So suddenly, we had an incredibly accurate clock. And the first few weeks, we were going down in the morning, looking at the clock, and just pinching ourselves. Because it was just unchanged. And that doesn't happen with mechanical clocks normally. So we decided, right, this is, this is exciting. So we kept the clock in a Perspex case. The Perspex case is screwed to studs, bolted to the wall by a studs. So we drilled through the studs, put wires, and asked the National Physical Laboratory, that's uh, the UK equivalent of NIST, um, to come and put their impression on a wax seal so that we could prove to people that we hadn't been sneakily opening the case and prodding the pendulum. <laughs> and we set the clock, first of all, to an unofficial trial. Um, and the results were fantastic. The trial were, ran over about 100 days, and the clock was, well, it was around within a second of time. Now, the interesting thing was when we changed the bar when we got the barometric problem sorted, a new temperature problem occurred. We found that a new temperature effect was happening. And this, is, this has been a tremendous learning curve for, for many of us. That the temperature, it was causing changes in the way that the pendulum bob interacted with the air. And the, the temperature compensation on this clock was fixed. It was a solid, because the pendulum rod is made of invar, which has a very low temperature coefficient of expansion. And, and so you use a little brass cylinder to provide the upward expansion to counteract the very minute expansion of the invar. And this is not adjustable. It was perfect for the clock as it was before barometer was compensated for. So with an adjustable temperature compensator, this could be an extraordinarily stable clock. To give you an idea, now, it is almost two years to the day that we applied the seals to the clock. And two days ago, when I left the workshop, the clock was showing precisely one second fast, which is an extraordinary achievement in two years. But last year, we had a leap second. <laughs> UTC was slowed down by one second. So the clock, after two years, and I kid you not, is showing zero error. And I think with that, 
I would say, happy birthday, Mr. Harrison. And thank you all for listening. I'll, I'll just say thank you very much to, to Robert, who has been absolutely fantastic and has treated me like royalty, it has to be said. Um, also to the research um, and really strong support from Andrew King, Jonathan Betts, William Andrews, uh, Donald Saff for being so incredibly generous in allowing us to have his clock for so long, and, and Chris King, who nobody here, I, well, you may know him, Chris King is my colleague at the Maritime Museum who shot the beautiful footage of the timekeeper. So thank you very much for listening. Rory has kindly uh, agreed to take a few um, easy questions. And any that are hard, we will um, have my colleague Jay Dowling address. <laughs> are there any questions? Okay. Um, well, we know for certain in the early days when he was making the pendulum clocks, he was working with his brother James. Uh, James's name appears on the clock dials. Um, there's there's one of Mystic bearing James Harrison's name. Um, yes, he. We don't know exactly uh, throughout the history which workmen were working for Harrison, but it is highly likely that there were people working for him during the construction of ages two, three, and certainly four. Um, so, so yeah, he did have people working with him and for him. Yes. Yes. How did they deal with corrosion and steel back then? Uh, very good question. Well, Harrison dealt with corrosion and steel by using as little of it as possible. Um, I now mentioned the use of bronze. So the majority of the machine is made of brass or bronze. The components that unavoidably are made of steel are the, um, the springs that uh, govern the oscillators, be they bar balances or the... Uh, so that's not avoided, but... Yes, sir. How do you make a clock that doesn't require lubrication? Okay, um, this is, um, if you think about why a clock needs lubrication, it is because the components rub each other, they slide. So, John Harrison, wherever there were interacting components, he changed that contact from sliding to rolling. And that hugely reduced the uh, friction and therefore the need for lubrication. But he did, in a roundabout way, use lubrication because he used this tropical hardwood, lignum vitae. And that has a, a naturally oily property. And he used that for the bosses that carried the smooth rimmed wheels that rolled with the arbors, um, and they ran on pins, so the, the lignum is running on pins, and that is a form of lubrication, but it is certainly not applied oil. <coughs> so that's the essence of it. I mean, the grasshopper escapement is incredibly clever and has no rubbing contact. It's a very precise locking, pivoting, and releasing. Thank you very much, Rory. Thank you, Rory. <laughs> Thank you Rory. Rory has set the bar very high uh, for lectures here at Skinner. And um, if you um, heard about this from a direction other than an email contact, uh, and would like to leave your email address for you. We assure you that we will use it solely to notify you about events like this and um, not put you into a constant uh, email blast. I think there are cards uh, over there which uh, you could uh, fill out. Uh, I think it would, uh, in view of the um, turnout tonight, I think it would be very, very nice to uh, continue with this maybe on a yearly basis. 
but wow, Rory has set the uh, bar very high, <laughs> and we thank you for that. Longitude has always been a wonderful subject for people. Uh, back at the Longitude Symposium in 1992, uh, there were over 500 people attend from 39 different states and seven different countries. So it was considered one of the uh, most important horological conferences ever, ever held uh, at Harvard University. And uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Will Andrews uh, in, in uh, hosting that event, which is still being uh, talked about today. So we all, uh, yes? I'd, I'd like to ask one question for sure. Rory. Uh, why was he so bitter uh, once he had been paid? What was the cause of his bitterness? Um, because it took so long to come. Um, I, you know, that's that's all I can say. So he, he had earned it by when in his life? I, I think from his point of view, as soon as the success of the trial had been successfully completed, I think he wanted closure and to be able to move on. I, I'm only supposing, but that's how I see it. So it took him another, what, 20 years to get paid? Yeah, well, if you think about it, after age four, I don't think, can, can everybody hear? Yeah. yeah. After age four, he was asked to make another watch. And no jokes about the name of that one. <laughs> he was in his 60s. Now, watchmaking is a demanding discipline. And to be, able, to be asked to, you know, it, it must have been exhausting for him. And, and I believe that the pendulum clock was where he wanted to be. He wanted to be finishing what he started. Great. Yeah. Did you have to have to finish Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We won't be putting it there on trial, but we will be closely monitoring its behavior. And we hope to be fitting a, an adjustable temperature compensation. So yeah, good question, thanks. How many have seen the Harrison clocks at Greenwich? Wow, nice, nice turnout. It's a religious experience, I think. <laughs> Um, at the risk of embarrassing a couple of people, uh, I'd like you all to know Richard Ketchin. He's sitting in the front row. He was another principal at the uh, Longitude Symposium, and he's conservator of the uh, clocks and historical uh, scientific instruments at Harvard. Uh, we have the director of the Willard House here. Uh, the Willard House is uh, not, not far from here in North Grafton. Uh, you can go and see the Harrisons of New England right nearby here. Uh, we're a far cry from Harrison Skills, but uh, it's the home and birthplace of the Willard Clockmakers, and I encourage you all to uh, to visit. Uh, there's plenty more coffee back there if you'd like coffee. And again, thank you all for coming. This has been a very, very <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Laurie. Hi. Uh, Hi. My, my late uncle 